Last year, a good friend said, Terry, if you want to meet the ultimate fire starter, you must meet Rena Shaw. When I finally had a chance to talk to her, I realized that my friend could not have been any more right. Rena is a Republican political advisor, media contributor, and social entrepreneur, as well as an ardent advocate for getting more women to run for political office. All the things that I love. During her freshman year in college, Rena was looking to make some extra money. So she answered an ad in the campus daily newspaper. The ad was placed by another college newspaper, which called itself the alternative to the campus daily. The position advertised was for copy editor. Rena really had no idea what the alternative to the campus daily meant, but she loved writing and editing and figured she could do the job. Well, she got the job, one that will wind up changing the trajectory of Rena's career. As she corrected reporters' grammar, she slowly realized that this was the conservative newspaper, and it was indirectly funded by the renowned conservative think tank, the Heritage Foundation. The mainstream daily newspaper, as actually was considered liberal, at least by those of the outlet where Rena worked. By Rena's senior year, she worked as the managing editor, and the Heritage Foundation flew her to DC, where she attended talks by conservative political theorists and was given a bookcase full of political titles. I quickly realized that these were my views, Rena says. I found out that I believed a lot of what I was reading and became more passionate about taking those messages into our society. So today's Fireside Chats with Fire Starters, we are going to ask Rena about all those things and that fabulous trip to DC. And I want to know what are those political titles, which of them were on her bookshelf. But thank you, Rena, for joining us today. We're so delighted to have you not only a part of this conversation, but a part of Find Your Fire. Oh, thank you. The, the honor is all mine to be part of your very, very impactful collection of stories. I love stories. Storytelling has always been at the heart of everything I've done, particularly the past 10 years. And so it's a pleasure to be with someone like yourself who has, has spread this message and shared the stories that I know are going to really inspire women for years and years to come. It's so funny because a lot of the women in Find Your Fire, like I've known just from political circles or social mm -hmm. impact, and you and I had not met, but we have like the a very similar resume and all the same friends. <laughs> like, I couldn't like, believe we hadn't met. Yes. It's yes. crazy, right? <laughs> It, it was it was funny. I remember thinking that when you and I got connected uh, through our good friend Jennifer Sarver, who is just inspirational and an incredible woman, who is always just happy warrior is what I always uh, always think of her as. And I've always had that spirit, I believe, as well. And so when she connected you and I and just said, how come I have never crossed paths with this woman? And so here we are. Yes, but I, I've heard so much about you from Aditi, who's also in the book. Um, yeah. who wrote the forward and even Neri, who is someone that I know oh. from DC, but everyone has one word to describe you. And well, actually it might be two. They all oh. say that you are <laughs> smart and you get it done. And that's why I think you're a fire starter. That is so kind. I think it's the ultimate compliment to be productive in society. You know, when people recognize that and say, you're somebody that gets stuff done, to me, there's just nothing more I would want to be known as if I, you know, if life ended tomorrow, for example, what do we, what do we ever accomplish? And it's just showing people that things can get done. If you have a heart for something, go out, do it and, and make it happen. Do everything you can to make it happen. That's really been a theme for me that was espoused um, really by my parents more than anybody yeah. else yeah well I want to start there you know yeah. we definitely have a lot in common with it by way of resume but sure. your love for your parents it is very similar and just as strong as love that I have for mine so I'd love for you to talk to us a little bit about how your family came to the United States and just tell us a little bit about your parents sure and it was such a joy to be able to share that in the book in my chapter is that you know we are a result of our experiences and I'm, I'm a big believer that experiences really where do they begin in the home so our roots are everything you know sometimes especially in American society um, I'm a first generation American the daughter of immigrants this is this is the land where most of us leave home at age 18 to go do the great American college experience and I think for me um, having left all those years ago leaving home 
it just never felt like leaving home because mm-hmm. I carry with, within me so much of my ancestral stories, beliefs, values, that everything I do is a result of they, um, I've done what they poured into me. It's a result yeah. of them and their hard work and their sacrifice. And so my parents, their immigrant stories are those that are, they're not great in, in, in many ways. They're not idyllic. They're, they're full of hard work and and challenges and and I really think there were a lot of probably ugly moments that I did not know about growing up Mm. but the reality was that they made it through each of those moments with a smile and that's what I think is my sort of um responsibility now that I have kids of my own I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old and so I think a lot about my parents and what they poured into me my grandparents and what they said you know what they believed it was the right way to live and the best Best, most, I would say the best example, most pointing example of really my upbringing on one was love thy neighbor. And, and that was really something, and we're a non-Christian family. And I realized that's, that's a, really a phrase that is, I heard a lot in, in, in the houses of worship throughout our country, particularly churches, but, but in those same words, of course, but that is a, such yeah. a universal phrase, right? And my parents really sent me out into the world in 18, um, always making sure I knew that serving other people was the way to serve myself. And that's kind of a funny way to put it, I realize. Um, But, you know, ultimately we as all human beings want to advance ourselves. We want to be somebody in the world, right? But my family's entire thought process was that we don't get anywhere without serving others. And so I derive a lot of my happiness by what I'm able to do for other people. It genuinely brings me joy to connect somebody with an idea or with another person. Um, I always say I'm the resource queen in that way. I'm a connector of people. <laughs> that's what I just I understand. What I do. And you are the, so much the same. And I think that's where we have met um, so happily and wholly with our personal and professional journeys is that there's a lot of that that comes in, in my line of work, particularly in politics. It can be very nasty sometimes, but I've always mm-hmm. taken that happy warrior mentality is that I can get things done in a happy way. And I can also do it by working for my neighbor because that serves me too. Yeah, I love that. So much of what you said resonates with me. I I tell everyone, especially in politics, you know, as a lobbyist, I can always choose to go below the belt, but I try to stay above because it feels better to deposit in the good karma bank than than to not, right? And Mm -hmm. you always see the results come back tenfold. You know, I... Love that you distill the lessons from your parents and you love thy neighbor. And when you serve thy neighbor, you serve yourself. It is almost exactly the same of the two things that I carry with me in my heart from my family, which is faith and fortitude. And so, you know, when you, you definitely have faith and fortitude, all the rest comes. It just flows from your heart. So true. And then we, right now we need that. You know, this has been a tough weekend here in Washington, uh, mm-hmm. especially with the passing yes. of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Justice Ginsburg was a force. She, we lost an icon. We lost a yes. giant among men. And she was the type of justice that I think if my daughter ever to say it, were to ever say to me, I want a legal career. My mother was a lawyer in India. And, oh, um, wow. you know, it was a, it's an interesting journey, the law, because the law can be used for good. It can be used for bad. But what Justice Ginsburg did was open so many doors. And I don't think we American women could have the lives we have today without her. There's just no way mm-hmm. when you look at what she was able to accomplish for us. For example, we would not be able to have a mortgage. A woman could not go get a mortgage signed on her own without the, the co-signature of a man. That's so massive. Yeah. And yeah. I just think that we have so much to really um, honor and value the lives of women like that who, who fought knowing that what they were working on was so much bigger than themselves and, and that they had faith for the future, that what they were setting out to do, though be it very novel and difficult, um, that they could get it done. And, and she just, I'm just thinking about her life and legacy all day long. I, I went there Friday night after the news. I had mm. to be near the Supreme Court. And I, um, I was there in, in joining with fellow women, just of, of all ages, so many men there. There was just so much in the air. Of course, there was uh, a real sadness and, mm-hmm. and a bit of a fear as well as to what's to come. Um, mm-hmm. given the politicization of, of the Supreme Court justices, you know, these days. It's it's a unique era we live in. So I just try to remember what's most important is to keep the faith. 
Um, yeah. And whether that's about, you know, God to you, or maybe you're a person who doesn't believe in God, but you have a faith in something else. That's okay. It's the beauty of our country. We can all live here peacefully in harmony if we just agree to disagree. Yeah, the belief that, you know, we are here for a purpose much larger than ourselves and that we can do it with others. And when I think about fortitude, oh my gosh, you know, just fortitude is just having that will and that desire to overcome anything. And RBG definitely is the epitome of fortitude. Um, you know, I too was so sad on Friday. Um, I was trembling. It, you. Yeah. There's so few women and just so few icons in our lives where we, you know, aspire to be like them. We see a little bit of ourselves in them. And yeah. that fight she had is something that I really try to um, lean in on. And yeah. so we've lost so many greats this year. Yeah, um, we have. Yeah. yeah, I just reflected on that on Friday. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think at there's this piece of us that that leaves with them, but it also makes room for all of us to carry out that legacy mm-hmm. and to, to just take it a step further. And so I, I want to get a little bit into your professional background because I, I think it so beautifully illustrates the ways that we can further legacy and the different ways that we can get a message out or the different ways that we can be a part of the political process. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your professional journey? It's been a wild and wacky one, one that's definitely been a road that wasn't straight and narrow. I don't think I could have ever predicted I'd be here um, 10 years ago. I've been out on my own as a political consultant. Really, that's my professional title more than anything else. I've consulted on so many races, so many initiatives. I'm, I'm nearing 30 some uh, this mm-hmm. year. Uh, yeah, maybe closer to 40, I hope, by the end of next. It just wow. seems like everything I do leaves another door um, open for me to, to go and have some impact in stuff that other people have already built, or there's an opportunity for me to join with other people who are doing great coalition work. That's the beauty of Washington. There's just so many people doing such impactful work, whether it's related to government or related to, you know, just bettering people in general, bettering mm-hmm. our lives as Americans. And so for me, it started pretty simply after leaving college. I went to West Virginia University, my state school. I was born and raised in West Virginia. I went there on an engineering scholarship. And then as you started out with uh, reading from the chapter, I wrote for my conservative publication on campus. And I, writing was very, very much my first love. Reading um, at the same time, yes. But writing, I think at a very young age, I realized that that was, um, I don't know, if anybody would, you know, say their own writing is, is a gift or a talent, you know, there are people who've been critical of my writing. It's really not the best, but for me, it is what it is because it is, it is mine and I'm proud of it. And uh, so truly professionally, these past 10 years, I, I have been a speech writer for other people, uh, mainly elected, um, as well as those running for Congress. Usually I've worked on some state house races and this all kind of came to me after I had about a, almost a four year stint on Capitol Hill working for two members of the U.S. House of Representatives. It was from there that I learned what political campaigns were really all about. Um, I volunteered on a couple around the time that I was also a Hill staffer. So in volunteering, I would say I got to see the good, the bad, and the ugly, but it wasn't until I became an operative, started my own business as an operative, started traveling, immersing myself in, camp- immersing myself in campaigns, that I realized how really, really tough it is. Yeah, it is. A, it is a tough field because it is a male dominated field. It is a field that is very ageist. It is a field mm-hmm. that is tough to make money in unless you are up at the upper echelon working for a really great firm. And again, ageism in that you've been in it for many, many years. And I think these are some realities that I had not been fully honest with myself about when I took that leap. And so um, I set out and I was fortunate enough in that first year to go ahead and nail a, <laughs> a big time client as one would call it, um, a guy who was running for president. He had worked for three former presidents. He was an actor from LA and he 
he was a gay man. And in the 60s, he decided to run for president as a Republican. So he was the first ever openly gay candidate for president Incredible. from a major political party. Very cool guy. His name was Fred Carger. And he's there in the history books, but do people know his name? No, but you got to start somewhere. And Fred gave me the chance and he made me the communications director overnight. I met him and we just clicked and he liked my writing. He liked my work. And we really had such a grand time going from New Hampshire to South Carolina to Puerto Rico oh, wow. to California to Minnesota and it was such an incredible journey that first year that I was in business for myself um, but I also learned how again tough it is when you've got to balance the pay you know balance the checkbook you've got to make payroll for the couple staffers that you hired and then you got yeah. it for me I say you because this was me this was me at the end of my first year after having made these hires having you know looking at everything and saying I can't afford to keep you people on and that was so tough so I was a business mm -hmm. owner but I was a political operative and I've continued in that vein and, and just had such a great time growing in this field because politics is not nasty as some people really think it's it's a field through which you you get to learn about your fellow man so so much you get to affect change the way you want to do it and that's through public policy obviously it's a creative way to do it through political campaigns but you get to talk about what's important to you, what's on your heart, what may be most important at that particular time to your community, your fellow citizens. And I just think that we are not best served as a country right now, even right now in the year 2020, because we have so few women at all levels of US government. We do not have enough. And as, as everybody probably watching knows, we make up a little over half of this country's population, right? Yeah. So that's, that is where I believe we have failed each other as a country. We do not have a representative democracy. We don't have a reflective democracy. We don't have one that really speaks about what's important to all of us. If we don't have enough women at the table crafting public policy, guess what? That public policy doesn't work for all of us. That's so right. That's been my passion. That's really where I've come to these past few years. And to that end, a couple of years ago, I got together with two women and three of us co-founded Women's Public Leadership Network. That was such a joy and a pleasure. And I've since left there and I'm a board member emeritus there, but I, it's incredible work they're doing to get more right-leaning women into office because that's where there's really a lack of women in, in, elected to, to federal office, especially in Congress. We see such low levels of Republican women when you, you, you see a comparison to Democrats. So that's a, a great, a great wish of mine was to, to try to work on that. And so Women's Public yeah. Leadership Network is addressing that. And I'm also on the boards of Running Start, which brings more young women, so high school and college age women into government politics, represent women, which speaks about the facts and the figures and how system changes and reforms uh, can help get more women elected, as well as Vote Run Lead. We do trainings across the country and Republican Women for Progress. So these are the four organizations that I pour my soul into lately to be, a, a, I advise, you know, I sort of give whatever I can of my time to mentoring young women, but that is what my life is about now. And it's because I had these great experiences these past nine and a half years where I can say, this is what I learned on a campaign trail. This is what I learned working in a member of Congress's office. This is what I learned when I sat and wrote this governor's speech. And these were the moments that that really taught me more than any textbook could have taught me. So while my career path is an unconventional one, um, I would say it's one that I, I probably uh, would have never predicted for myself. And it's, it's had its very, very lows, but it's also had its highs. I'm so, so glad to be doing this work. I'm blessed mm -hmm. to be doing this work. Yeah, you said so much. I wanna unpack some of that. And again, so much of it resonates. You know, One of my very first jobs was um, serving as the the editor of the Catholic student newspaper at LSU. Oh <laughs> so I know gosh, all yeah. about those college you newspapers. Know. But, you know, my, my journey is very um, similar to yours from working in television to being a press secretary for a U.S. Senate campaign, you know, to um, while you were, you know, on Capitol Hill, I was a lobbyist. And, and now I, I truly um, like to get people involved in the process, no matter what it is. And I tell everyone, you know, you might see, you know, a, a journey that isn't really straight, but yet right. it is. Um, it there's is. one tenant mm -hmm. through all of those jobs that runs through me, it's the, which is the common thread, and it's providing information to people so they can make decisions for themselves and their community. And I hope they take that information and they use it for good. And so in every situation that you just outlined, 
I feel like you're, you're doing the same. Even if you're writing a speech for an elected official, you're helping them disseminate that information. Mm -hmm. Or if you're, you know, creating a platform for women to learn at, you know, vote, run, lead, they are getting information to do good. And so I, I just admire the way that you keep pouring into others and pouring into yourself at the same time to the point yeah. you made earlier. But I want to dig more into something that you said, which is, you know, women make up half of the voting population. We really can drive a lot of this conversation, yet we don't see a lot of women raising their hand and saying they want to run for office, especially if they're women that are conservative. Tell me, what are the obstacles? How can women overcome them? And then give them a booster shot at the end to encourage them to run. That's, you know, thank you for those questions. Those are great questions. It's like, how do I get more women to run if I care about that particular thing? You're a woman who, you know, cares, it seems. And, and that's a wonderful thing because we should want that. We should want to fix something that we see wrong. And so you don't have to be a political person. I often get that from some friends who've never done anything in politics is that, you know, I, I care, but I'm not a political person. I'm like, well, caring is enough. You want to see something happen? Well, here's how to affect that change. And But I have a story, of course, to tell you um, to sort of lead and, and answer your question very quickly. And, and it's about a woman running um, in Florida. Her name is Dina Francois. And uh, she's just an incredible person. She's of Caribbean descent. Uh, she's a she's a black woman. She is just incredibly uh, warm and 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 more than warm. She is just flip smart, very very oh. like quick with it. You know, you just can't you can't catch me in an off guard because she's so smart. And and I'm thinking to myself, how does she you know how does she answer things so fast because she's always thinking. And she came to me in a funny way. And so I was talking about how writing and editing have always been a part of my life. Well, when I was 19, I started a resume editing business. <laughs> wow. Because I was copywriting <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, there are some friends originally needed some help with their essays and some then needed some help with some personal statements who are a few years older than me, some more to applying to med school and then um, in law school. And so they were being asked to write these personal statements and I would help them write them. And alongside that, they'd be like, hey, I need to include a resume. And so Eventually, I started editing these personal statements and resumes, and so I started a business doing so. I would get paid for it in college, and it was That's it was incredible. great. And <laughs> when I moved to DC when I was 23, um, well, almost yeah, almost 23, I would say it was it was such a, a joy to be able to have that. I I felt you know really unique ability to make money off of what I enjoyed. And, <laughs> and so I, so I was continued doing that in DC to earn some, you know, side money because I wasn't making much money as a public policy associate in my first job. And so, um, I was doing that on the side. I kept the business going and, uh, yeah, it was just within like a couple months that I got bought out by a couple from out West and they had found me online and those are the early days. <laughs> I don't want to date myself, but this was circa 2006. And, um, and so, yeah, it was such a joy to have this couple find me and say, we really love the business you've created. I had a website, I had a whole process to how I work people, worked with people. And I had, um, how can I put it <laughs> in, in, in no, uh, really uncertain terms. I had done over 500 resumes myself. Oh my gosh. By that's that incredible. Age. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that is I, and it, on its own. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, I'll say there were, there were old school websites, such as Craigslist, <laughs> which is, I know still around, but Craigslist was very much my friend and I got a lot of business and, and Dina and I met by, you know, just through friends on or, around Washington. And she said, Hey, I'd love for you to work on my resume. Well, she was much, much older than me. And this was not uncommon because the, these were the resumes I eventually started doing when I was getting business off online. And, um, and so Dina and I met because she wanted more for herself. She wanted a job. She was an attorney and she was looking for another legal job. And she had such an impressive resume. And I remember thinking then that, wow, she's an incredible person. And this was, of course, now I'm talking 14 years ago. Um, but she, she was confident when I met her, but she was so not confident about what she had on paper about herself. And that really got my cogs turning about how can I help feel, make women feel uh, what they really are, you know, yeah. and, and express that, portray that, convey that to the world. And 
you know, it's just a beautiful friendship start like that when you when you find a way to help people. So of course it started as a business relationship, but she came to me almost four years ago and she said, I think I want to move back to Florida and we were in DC. And she said, I think I want to run for Congress. And so oh she mounted gosh. her first congressional run then. And I is an honor and a privilege to say that I was one of the people that encur encouraged her to do that and said, you will have a check from me. You will have, it might not be a big check, but you will have some money from me. Yeah. Um, Cause she had paid me all those years ago <laughs> to do her resume. And I said, you know, Vina, it's not about I, how funny the irony that I'm now returning that money to you in the form of a political contribution. But to me, that contribution contribution with my belief in her, the feeling that she could speak her truth to power by running for something that was so important to her. So her first primary, she lost, and now she's in uh, her second race. And, and she's just such a powerful woman because she she is so, so many things if people look her up, but, um, but you know, that confidence that comes from your friends telling you yes. that they believe in you you need to ask women around you to run. You need to ask them if they want to run. And that's what I tell everybody, that we are in this moment where, you know, I re routinely on my Insta stories put up stuff that says, have you even considered running? Ever considered running? And then I throw the DM box on there. And I've gotten really great DMs over the past few months because I want people to know, yes, it is tough. It is tough when people are saying things about you. They're dissecting your entire life. You know, part of entering the public sphere, there's a beautiful part. You can talk about your hopes and your dreams mm -hmm. and what's important to you and what you think can make a better country and community. However, there are so many sides that you know, people are not comfortable with, mainly women. We tend to not like the negative campaigning that's really um, just now commonplace. It is yeah. part of our system now. <laughs> And that's why I'm supporting something called ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting is an incredible reform that really basically punches this winner take all notion out. We don't need that. It's like a multiple choice test. And it's just so great as a reform because ranked choice voting balances the playing field. It levels it in a way that I believe is so fair and it allows for women and minorities, people who generally wouldn't have a chance, even lower income people, it doesn't protect the incumbent. It makes it more easy and accessible to get involved because you don't have to worry about these winner take all contests. And so I encourage anybody listening to look into ranked choice voting. That's a really great way to get more women into politics and we need to see more states do it. There's some data already and head over to representwomen.org uh, to, to check out that data. They have some incredible reports on what ranked choice voting has done for women. And look, I'm not for quotas. As a conservative, as a lifelong conservative, just that's not me. And you know, look, I, I don't I don't mean to disrespect anybody that does believe in quotas. Mm -hmm. I just don't believe that that's best for our country. I really do believe in the free market. And I, I am somebody that thinks that capitalism has made our country really incredible. Um, there are good and bad sides to everything. We can always debate that. But to get more women in, we need some systems reform. But we also need some of the soft reforms, like I was talking about. Ask a woman to run. Get a woman to a party meeting or any kind of coalition meeting that's happening. Get a woman to think about an initiative that she wants to bring to her local city council. Think about where you can impact your community in the way in which you want to see. And that, that's the way that I think women get to public service is we are yeah. entrepreneurial innately. We see a problem and we want to fix it. And so that's, that's my entire story as to why and how. And of course, I want anybody to reach out to me that's watching that just wants a more direct path. I love talking to people one-on-one -on -one about what their trajectory could be. That's incredible. You said so much. And there were two things that I want to just put a pin in. And one is you should run and we should encourage each other to run, you know? We encourage each other when we wear jeans that look good. We're like, girl, those jeans look good on you. <laughs> you know, yeah. so when we yeah. see a woman that has leadership qualities and dares to dream, we need to encourage her in the very same way. And, you know, so I say that not to make light of it, but to say that it's something that is commonplace for us as women. We tell each other um, that we are amazing every day, but we need to shift that and pivot it in a manner that it will serve us as leaders that can turn moments into movements. The other thing you said that I just want to like underscore is, is that 
the woman that you mentioned in Florida, you know, with this incredible resume, you know, this incredible just um, drive and, and wanting to be a servant leader in her community. She did not win that first time. But what you said right after was she's in her second race. Right. So for anyone that is running, um, if you do not win that first time, do not give up. You know, that desire and that reason why you got in the race the first time, really, it only gets stronger, you know, every race. And so I, I definitely want to encourage people to run a second time. So Rena, you are so incredible. You talked about giving out nuggets um, over your Instagram. Tell us how to find you on IG. What is your IG handle? Yeah, sure. I'm just Rena in DC. That's R-I-N-A-I-N-D-C. And you, you also said you had like a resume website, but do you have a, a website today and what is it? You know, I have a placeholder right now and I'm getting ready to debut a blog soon. Um, I, I'm not sure if it'll be before election day, so don't hold me to it, uh, ladies and gents, but I'm going to try. So I'm at runwithrena.com and I am working oh, I on something it. a little special to debut. If I can get it done before election day, I'm going to try, but I've again been pulled in a couple different directions and hopped onto a couple new projects um, ahead of November 3rd because this election is just way too important. And so I've kind of put other things on hold to say, wh where do I want to have the most impact? And so I'm working on Republican yeah. Women for Biden. That's an initiative I launched this summer and doing some grassroots work through that. And then I've also joined the Lincoln Project as some viewers maybe yes. I've joined their so Women's many Coalition. Incredible people there. Yeah, so we have a, um, we are hashtag Lincoln Women. I'm on the steering committee there and really working on just some, some good stuff. I hope to get people mobilized and energized about this election. It is tough every four years and this time we've got an incumbent. Um, obviously, if people look me up, they know what my feelings are. And you just heard that I am supporting um, former Vice President Joe Biden because I do think he'll be the best uh, for everyone in, um, in the White House. However, you know, look, I just want people to get up and get out and vote. And so so I hope that if you go to my website, yes, there is a, a way to reach out to me. There's a contact button there, but I do keep up on Twitter more often than anywhere else. That's where I'm at. I'm okay. on Twitter as well at Rena in DC. And you'll hear from me there probably in a few hours. That's <laughs> awesome. Tweeting, I love it. I'm, I'm tweeting like a mad woman these days. <laughs> I'm just getting back into the, the swing of Twitter. I am. Um, I sat down and chatted with a social media strategist and I'm like, yeah. by the time I get to Twitter, it's like the end of the day, I don't have any intelligent thoughts. You know, I just want to like talk about my day. And so she assured me, she's like, you can have intelligent conversations on Twitter and, and those are great, but you should view Twitter as your diary. And sometimes it's just okay to just say your feelings and just let people know what's going on. So, um, I have enjoyed like participating in the conversations on Twitter that are just yeah. um, lighthearted and people supporting yeah. each other in every way. So I yeah. will follow you. <laughs> and I will follow you. <laughs> I'm surprised I don't already again. Like here we are, but our, our virtual friendship is blossoming. So thank you. Sherry. I know. It's You've incredible. been so kind. You've been so kind. Well, thank, thank you. you so much. You've given me the booster shot that I need oh. to get through the day. And I have a tough week ahead. So I'm so happy that we're <laughs> able to have this conversation. And I know fire starters everywhere will like appreciate it as well. Oh, and thank so, you. Yes. I did yes, that sentiment. Here. I always get lifted every time I speak to you. So I, yeah, good luck with the week ahead. And I'm just so glad we could do this. Yes. Well, for all of you that are out there, thank you for watching this Fireside Chats with Firestarters. Please follow Rena on Twitter, on Instagram, and we'll be sure to give you information when her new blog comes out. Oh my gosh, I can't even wait. So follow TerryBWilliams.com for all things Movement Maker, and we'll see you next time as leaders who will turn moments into movements.